And welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Every year, 50 million students begin school. The most common chronic illness for school children is underlying allergies, nasal allergies, skin allergies, lung allergies, and they cause over 2 million school days lost every year. We'll be spending most of this show talking about allergies with school children. My guest is Dr. Karthik Krishnan. Dr. Krishnan is a board certified allergist. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes in the Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about esophageal reflux. Why do so many people have reflux disease and what can we do to help that? And Bell's palsy, seventh cranial nerve paralysis. What causes it and what can be done for it? A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board certified allergist, and we're talking about allergies in school children. Karthik, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you for having me. Tell me about allergies in school children. How serious and how significant is it? Right, so allergic diseases have a significant impact on school aged children, and it can lead to serious problems in a school setting. Is it the most common chronic illness in school children? It is. Up to 40% of children will have allergic rhinitis, 20% of children will have asthma, and up to 8% of children will have food allergies. So allergic rhinitis is nose problems. Correct. Does that interfere with people and with children in school? It does. There's good evidence to show that poorly controlled allergic rhinitis can cause problems at school, and those include missing school and also not performing well in school. So allergic rhinitis, that's an allergic nose. Uh, what are the symptoms that somebody has? Yeah, so the classic symptoms for allergic rhinitis are runny nose, sneezing, itching of your nose, your eyes, and the most bothersome one is congestion. So the congestion, the nose is always full. How does a teacher or a parent know if their children are suffering from allergy symptoms? Yeah, so there's some simple signs they can look for. One is dark circles under the eyes. Those are called allergic shiners. Some children have creases under the lower eyelids. Those are called Denny Morgan lines. And some people have a crease that goes across the base of the nose, and that's from doing this, and we call that the allergic salute. <laughs> so those are some simple things to look for. So you look for Denny's lines, uh, you look for a horizontal crease on the nose and right. the allergic shiners. Right. Now, when children have allergies and they have the, that appearance, mm -hmm. what's going on that's interfering with their ability to function as a student? Okay, so one of the biggest problems is since they have poorly controlled symptoms and congestion is the one that bothers them the most, it really interferes with their sleep at night. So they don't get well rested at night. And so this, when they wake up, they're already fatigued, um, they're irritable, they're restless. And so when they get to school, they just can't concentrate and they can't focus on learning. So children need eight to nine, nine and a half hours sleep. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get that because of a stuffy nose, then they can't perform well. If you can clear up that nose, if you can get the nose better and the sleep pattern gets better, our st do studies show that they perform better? Yes, they do much better in school. Okay, so how do we identify if somebody's allergic and what they're allergic to? Yeah, so the only way to know what you're allergic to is by skin testing. Um, and what we do is we test to pollens, tree, grass, weed pollens, we can test the dust mite, cat, dog, and mold. Now, and do you find those things in schools? In school, do you find mold? So, yes, there can be mold in school settings. Dust? Yes. Animal dander? I don't see any dogs and cats running around inside schools. Yes, there's good studies that show that pet owners carry in the dander with them into the school setting. So, if I'm at home and I've got a cat at home and I go to school, then the cat dander that's on my clothing will get into the school room. Correct. That seems very minor. Would it be enough where actually children could start having problems 
because of the cat that I bring in, the cat dander. Yes, it can. So the symptoms they get is the congestion, the runny nose, the sneezing. So will skin testing, what's it like? Yeah, so what we do is we take drops of those different allergens, we put them on the back, we take a plastic toothpick, and we gently prick the skin and we wait 15 minutes. And a positive reaction will look like a mosquito bite. It'll have a little pale central area and redness around it and it'll itch. And so we wait the 15 minutes. If they have positive reactions, it'll look like mosquito bites. So you can tell if somebody's allergic to, you said pollen? Correct. So what time of year is tree and grass pollen? Yeah, so the tree pollens will be in the spring, typically March, April, May. And then grass pollen will be late spring, early summer. And then the weed pollen is going to be late summer, early fall. So that's ragweed season is right when school starts. So we've got ragweed and weed pollen mm -hmm. that we can identify by doing skin testing. Correct. Uh, where does uh, mold and dust, do we find those allergens in schools? Yes, we can. So mold is going to be found anywhere it's damp or moist. So older homes, older buildings, basements, crawl spaces anywhere there's been water damage or leakage. So if it's an older school, then there's potentially gonna be mold there. Dust might, we'll find that anywhere there's storage items. So bookshelves, um, there can be mold, I mean, uh, dust mite in those areas. So if somebody recognizes that their children has stuffy nose and congestion and dark circles under their eyes and Denny's lines on the eyes and the horizontal crease and they recognize they need help, they get mm -hmm. the skin testing, it Correct. identifies, then what does the allergist do? Okay, so we, we interpret the skin test results, we go over um, what the triggers are, and then we come up with the options. And there's three options. There's avoidance measures, there's medications, and there's allergy shots. So what can we avoid? Can you avoid pollen? So it's pretty hard to avoid pollen. We really don't want to restrict kids' activities. We want them outside playing at recess. Um, so what we recommend is they, if they are having a lot of problems, they can stay indoors more, keep the windows down, make sure they're running the air conditioning, especially when they're driving in the car, keep the windows up and, and use the recycled air. Medications, if we can't avoid allergens, mm -hmm. we have to use medications. Uh, are the medications good? What kind of medications would you suggest? Yeah, medications are effective, and the single best medication is going to be a nose spray. And there's two types of nose sprays. There's a steroid nose spray, and there's an antihistamine nose spray. So what we do is we spray these medicines directly onto the nose to control symptoms. So the steroid spray on the nose will help somebody with congestion, with it, the circles, with, the, with their itching and sneezing? It will. Uh, and the other you said is a topical antihistamine. Correct. Do you usually use them both together? You can use them both together or you can use them separately. But if you use them both together, there's studies to show that there's a 40% improvement in symptom control. 40% improvement. So that means 60% non-improvement. If a child has allergies mm -hmm. and the treatment gives them relief, but not really 100% relief, mm -hmm. um, then that child still is suffering from allergy problems? Correct. So what is the next stage? What can you do to give them total relief? Yeah, so our single best treatment option is allergy shots. Single right? best treatment plan is allergy shots. Correct. So what do the allergy shots do? Yeah, so what the allergy shots do is they trick the immune system. So what happens currently is that the allergens, the body recognizes them as foreign and they attack it and you have, there's a reaction and you have symptoms. With allergy shots over time, the body stops reacting to those allergens so we get good control of symptoms. Can you actually pretty much stop um, pollen from causing problems, from dust causing problems, from mold causing problems? Yes. When you, that happens, are you able to take away the medications? Yes. That's and what the, happens to the, the thinking function, the cognitive ability of the child in school? That will improve as well. So you're able to sleep better? Correct. Study better? Yep. Perform better? Yes. Everybody's happy? That's right. Does it keep you from getting a cold? It, it can minimize the complications by, yes, it can minimize the colds. So it can make colds where they're not as bad, but children are still going to get their colds and they're still going to get, uh, you know, problems with that. Right. Uh, if we can identify what somebody's allergic to mm -hmm. and we can start desensitizing, where does that 
involve children who are having lung problems mm -hmm. or are having food allergy problems. Um, do lung problems cause problems in school children? Yes, they do. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we come back. What kind of lung problems? Would it be cough? Would it be can't breathe good? Could it be asthma? What is asthma? And what can we do for it in school children? And then food allergies, huge problem on the increase. We'll be learning about that. We're talking with Dr. Karthik Krishnan, board certified allergist, and we've been talking about allergies in school children. We've been talking about the allergic nose, stuffy nose, runny nose, sneezing, drainage, dark circles, crease under the nose, crease under the eyes, causing symptoms where we, got, we have congestion, we don't sleep well, we don't perform well. Skin testing can identify if it's truly due to allergies and what the allergy problem is. And then we can either avoid that allergen, we can treat it with medications, or the best single treatment is a desensitizing allergy shot program to try and get rid of the allergies. Let's talk about lung problems in the school children. Correct. The major lung problem in children is asthma. And that's a problem with the airways in the lungs. And there's two components to it. There's twitchy airways, and that's called bronchospasm. And then there's swelling of the airways, and that causes obstruction. So when you have those problems, the symptoms you get are cough, wheezing, shortness of breath, and some children will talk about chest tightness or feeling uncomfortable in their chest. Is it scary for children? It can be. What are, what are some triggers of asthma in school children? Yeah, so the most common is colds that go around. Infection. Correct. And then the other is activity. So one of the questions I frequently ask is, can you keep up with the other boys and girls in, in recess? So when they're running around, exercise can cause? Coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. So it can flare the asthma. Mm -hmm. is, what can be done for that if somebody has exercise-induced asthma? Is there treatment available for yes, that? Yes, there's simple treatment. There's a medication called albuterol, and the brand names are Proventil, Ventolin, Proair and it's a bronchodilator. So what that does is it goes into the airways and it relaxes the smooth muscles. So it takes away that twitchiness or the bronchospasm and you get immediate relief. So what if a child is not keeping up with somebody else and they blame it on their lungs while well, I'm too short of breath? How do you make the diagnosis of asthma in school children? Okay, one sim if, we can, if they're coordinated and able to do it, there's pulmonary lung functions and the specific one is called spirometry. That's a way to assess their lung functions. So that will tell if they've got asthma or not? Correct, yeah. We look for certain um, trends on the spirometry. We look for obstruction and we look for reversibility. So if you find out that somebody's got asthma, you can give them albuterol to use. Do they Correct. need any other medication sometimes? Sometimes they do. If their symptoms are not controlled with albuterol as needed, then we need to put them on a preventative or controller inhaler. This is an inhaler that they take on a daily basis to control their symptoms. So does it calm down the lungs and make it where they don't get as twitchy as you said? Correct, so it, it can work on both components, the inflammation, the swelling in the airways, and also the twitchiness in the bronchospasm. How effective are those medications when you treat children that have asthma? They're very effective. Um, we were talking about allergies in lungs. Mm -hmm. Do allergies cause asthma? They can. So 80% of children with asthma will also have allergic rhinitis. So 80% of children in school that wheeze also have itchy, sneezy, runny nose. Correct. Do you have to treat both of them? You do. So it's very important when you evaluate somebody for asthma that you also evaluate for allergies with skin testing. And we want to aggressively treat the nose as well as the lower airways and the asthma. If a child comes to you and their main problem is asthma and they're coughing and wheezing, and that's what they're complaining about, if you neglect the nose, what happens as far as the efficacy of treatment? Right, it's a lot harder to treat the asthma. We have to rely on more medicines um, and they're at increased risk for exacerbations, relying on oral corticosteroids to control symptoms, more frequent office visits. So it's very, very important if somebody's having problems here in the lungs that you treat the nose up here also. Correct. Now, how do you identify if it's underlying allergy? Skin testing. The skin testing, and it will tell them if they're allergic to pollen, dust, or mold, you said, or animal dander. Correct. 
Uh, and can, if somebody has a cat and they're allergic to cat, cats and they have a cat at home, can they bring the dander into the schoolroom to cause problems with other people? Yes, they can. And the cat dander can cause nose problems and lung problems. Correct. Can you desensitize to dogs and cats? You can. Can you desensitize to pollen? Yes. Can you desensitize to dust mites? Yes. And can you desensitize to mold? Yes. Is the desensitizing, you said it's the number one treatment of mm -hmm. choice. Why do you feel that way? Why do you feel that medications aren't just as good? So the pro one of the problems with medications is compliance. People don't use their medicines on a regular basis. You have to use your medicines on a regular basis to get the best results. And, and we know there's good evidence to show that compliance is an issue. The other thing is we're not treating the underlying problem with the medications. We're just controlling the symptoms. symptoms. Whereas taking the desensitizing shots helps get rid of the problem. I Correct. want to switch quickly to yes. food allergies. Okay. Is that a problem in school? It seems to be more and more and more people are having food allergy problems. Correct. There's a rot, there's an increase in food allergies and, and particularly there's a big focus in the schools to manage food allergies. Are they serious? They can be. Can they be life threatening? They can be. What, what are the foods that cause most life threatening problems? Yeah, so the big ones are going to be peanut, tree nut, fish and shellfish. Those peanut and tree nuts are the ones that have the most reported fatalities. So do usually people know if they've got those allergies by the time they come, well, you know, I had peanut butter and my, everything swelled and I coughed and wheezed. They usually have that history when they come in or you have to search for it or b both? It, both. Some people will come in with a classic history. I ate a peanut butter cracker. I had lip swelling, tongue swelling. I had hives, I had trouble breathing, I had to go to the emergency room, and we see them that way. Others, it's, it's not as obvious, and so we have to evaluate and sort through it. Will skin testing help identify what food somebody's allergic to? It will. And the treatment of food allergies, can you desensitize to foods? We don't have that option yet. It's still in clinical trials, but in the future that definitely may be an option. So if somebody has food allergies, and let's say it's peanuts or fish, mm -hmm. What do you have to instruct them in the school? Stay away from peanuts? Or what are some of the hidden ways people can get that? Yeah, so the, the treatment option is avoidance. So we have to talk about educating parents, students, school teachers, school nurses about how to avoid it and prevent accidental ingestions. If somebody makes a mistake, and I want to get right to this little object right here, which is called a... EpiPen. So this is an EpiPen, and if somebody has a severe allergic reaction in school to foods or to bee sting allergies mm -hmm. or to any allergies, what will this do? That will save your life. This is a lifesaver. Correct. Do, uh, who knows how to use it in the school system? Everybody should know how to use it. So show me what this is and how to, how to use it. Okay, this is an epinephrine auto-injector. This brand is Epi EpiPen. So epinephrine will treat the allergic reaction and it's the life saver, right? Correct, there. it's adrenaline. So quickly show me how to use okay, it. Okay, so the, there's, this is the safety cap. This is the needle end. The hardest part is holding it. You wanna hold it like this. You hold it like make a dagger. It, make it like a, yeah, make Not a Not like fist. a plunger. Correct, we don't want it to go into your thumb. And so if you have a reaction, what you do is blue to the sky, orange to the thigh, you pull the safety cap outside of the leg, uh -huh. it can go through clothing, you push it down, you can hold it from anywhere from three to 10 seconds, and then you pull it out. Now when you pull it out, what happened to the orange to the thigh? It seemed to get bigger there. Yeah, the needle is covered. So it, it will cover up the needle. Correct. And you will have been injected adrenaline, and what correct. does that do to the allergic reaction? So it'll calm it down. It'll squeeze the blood vessels, it'll get your heart rate beating faster, it'll help you breathe easier, so it'll slow down the reaction. Now, it's a lifesaver. If children have food allergies, they should know that there should be an EpiPen or an, an adrenaline auto-jack uh, at school. Correct. Uh, and they should work that out with the principal. So, Correct. food allergies, big problem. You can identify those by skin testing Correct. and by the history Lung allergies, you can identify by skin testing allergies, good medicines. Nose allergies, you can identify by skin testing and finding out what they're allergic to and their good medications. 
Karthik, for the most common chronic illness in school children that have underlying allergies, are, is it reasonable to say we can control your allergies? Yes, we have good therapies to control your symptoms and improve your quality of life. Karthik, thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. You're a great teacher, and this is such a huge, huge topic and huge problem. Uh, all school children, moms of school children, uh, grandmoms and granddads, be sure that your children identify allergies and get it treated appropriately. And now you'll want to stay tuned. We're going to be talking about tips to handle esophageal reflux and Bell's palsy. Palsy of the seventh cranial nerves. What causes it and what can you do about it? A lot of information. You'll want to stay tuned. I want to thank Dr. Karthik Krishnan. Wonderful discussion on allergies in school children. And now questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, does everyone have GERD? Well, what's GERD? GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's a reflux of acid from the stomach up into the esophagus. When we swallow food, it goes down the esophagus and it passes through a sphincter and then the food gets through that sphincter, it goes into the stomach, then that sphincter closes. If it doesn't close good, some of the acid in the stomach comes back up into the esophagus, causes heartburn, acid indigestion. Why do so many people have that? And what are some tips of the trade that will help treatment and symptoms? Well, there are lots of reasons why people, there's an increased incidence of people having GERD. Number one is being overweight. When we're overweight, that pushes the contents of the stomach up toward the throat again. Number two would be having a weak sphincter in the lower part of the esophagus that allows that acid to come back up. Number three is eating a large meal or eating food before we go to bed. So when we lay down in bed, the food is able to reflux back up into the stomach. Uh, next thing would be eating too large meals or leaning over after you eat meals. It puts pressure on the stomach, which makes the food come back up in the esophagus. Heartburn, acid indigestion. What can we do to help prevent that? Well, there really are several logical things. Number one, if we lose weight, it makes it where there's not so much pressure coming up from the stomach up into the esophagus. So that's number one. Number two, when you lay down in bed, be sure you can elevate the head of the bed maybe three or four inches. Don't eat within two to three hours before you go to bed. Watch the foods that you eat, caffeine, certain mint foods, chocolate, all of these will increase uh, reflux disease. If you eat fatty foods, it keeps the food from going through the stomach to the rest of the GI tract, so it holds that acid in the stomach. So there are simple things that you can do to help relieve your symptoms. There are excellent medicines. If you've got heartburn, acid indigestion, and it's frequent, the best thing you can do is see your doctor and make sure that that heartburn, acid indigestion is not due to ulcers or any other serious problems that can be going on in the stomach. Good luck on your GERD. Question number two, Dr. Bob, is Bell's palsy due to a stroke? Well, Bell's palsy is a weakness or a paralysis of the seventh cranial nerve. That's the nerve that supplies muscles to our forehead, makes, makes, our, makes us have some lines in our forehead for expression. It will make us smile, makes us show our teeth. It can help close our eyes. And so if the seventh cranial nerve is blocked, we don't have the wrinkles on the eyes, we can't close our eyes well, we can't swallow good or we can't whistle because one side of the mouth is weak. It's usually a virus that's attacking the seventh cranial nerve. If you catch it early and start on a cortisone medication early, sometimes you can get the Bell's palsy to go away. 20 to 30% of the time, it will go away on its own. Sometimes people are left with residual weakness of that seventh nerve, so they'll have dif difficulty for a long period of time. If you find yourself having weakness of facial muscles, call your doctor immediately and get treatment started quickly. 
That's all the time that we have for this show. Remember those four things that we always like. Number one is exercise, most important thing you can do. Sometimes it's hard to do, but all we have to do is wake up, get on our tennis shoes and go out for a walk. Uh, walking, exercising uh, for 30 minutes, five, six, seven times a week. It doesn't have to be walking, ride a bicycle, work in the garden, um, get a friend, uh, be sure that activity is a, a problem, is a solution that you do with your friends. Be sure you're getting your seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. If you don't get a good night's sleep, you don't perform well the next day. So be sure that you know you're able to sleep well. If you're not sleeping well, think about, is it medications that you're taking? Is it pain that's there? Is there a problem? Do you need to discuss that with your doctor? If we eat properly and we eat smaller amounts and we eat good foods, then our health will be better. So exercise, sleep, nutrition, and most of all, what is it we like in the Dr. Bob show? It's that laughter in your life. It's amazing what laughter and humor will do to make you feel healthier and to make you happier and the people around you the very same.